everyone. Welcome to our Busan Gyeongnam chapter workshop. My name is Annika Kasem. I am the vice president of the chapter. And tonight we have, we're very excited to have Jose Domingo Cruz. Yay! So if you're not familiar with Jose, there's just like a little tidbit I want you to know about him. He's given a lot of presentations and keynote presentations for a lot of conferences and events. Uh, he's worked on several English study projects. He has a website called Goldfish365, which you can find a lot of his materials and a lot of background information. He is the author of Teaching with Zoom 2 from Wegu's Press. It, he's been the lead for the volunteers for room hosts for conferences such as PANSIG and JOLT National Conference. And that was especially important considering that was in 2020, <laughs> the year the pandemic decided it wanted to be a thing. Uh, he is the leading member of Online Teaching Japan. He leads an online discussion group on Facebook, which is related to professional development for pedagogy. He hosts broadcasts for OJ, OTJ TV. He is from Canada and he is a veteran university instructor and resident of Japan. He specializes in fluency instruction, authentic material creation, and online education. So please welcome Jose Domingo Cruz. Thank you, Anika. Thank you, Rea. Thank you to everyone who uh, made this possible. I'm more than flattered um, uh, to, to be here. And, and the enthusiasm that I'm getting from everybody is, 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 is almost making me nervous. Um, but yes, I have talked about this uh, topic before. And that's why the title of it this time is actually called Verbal Classrooms Plus Alpha. Um, I have talked about being able to find a way to get our students to talk more. I get the feeling that uh, instructors in Korea uh, have the same sort of um, uh, problems that we in Japan have um, dealing with students at the university level in that they're reticent, they're hesitant, they're shy, whatever word you want to use to actually um, get themselves to start pushing words out of their faces. I've had this problem, or I had this problem uh, for quite a while before I started doing verbal classrooms. And when I was introduced to this by a couple of guys in its raw form at the time, um, it was a godsend. Uh, it, uh, it allowed me to actually start focusing on what was important uh, for uh, teaching students how to actually speak a new language, whether it's actually English or French or Spanish, most Western languages will fall quite well uh, into the um, into the system that I'm about to show you. But what am I about to show you? I'm going to talk about fluency. And um, a long time ago, when I started talking about fluency in general, so back around 2015, 2016, when I started doing some presentations on fluency, one of the things that I would ask is I would ask people to go into small groups, or in this case, maybe a breakout room. We'll do it today, though. Uh, and um, groups of three or four or so, and ask them, in your mind, before I get into uh, the, the definition that I'm going to present to you, what is fluency to you? How do you define fluency? If, if somebody, if one of your students asked you, um, uh, uh, Mr. Cruz, I want to be fluent, but what is fluency exactly? How would you answer them? What would you say? Well, fluency means this. You can do this. You can do that. Or it isn't this or it isn't that. And I would put people into these groups. <clears throat> pardon me. And, um, and after maybe a couple of minutes, I'd have to ask them to report their, uh, their uh, discussion results. And you would get a few different things uh, that people would say. But one of the things that they would say is that, um, well, fluency is the ability to speak well. Or they would use other words, to speak eloquently. Uh, or one thing that seemed to be strangely common was there were people who would say, well, fluency is the ability to speak with complexity, accuracy, and fluency. I kid you not. They would say that fluency is made up of complexity, accuracy, and fluency, which, of course, is, as you can tell by Annika's face, completely tautological. You do not define a word by using the word itself. You, you, you go around in circles. Um, but people were kind of caught up with the idea that you had to have all of these skills before you actually became fluent. And I would answer if, when I had time, sometimes I didn't, uh, but I wanted to get people to think, okay, well, when you look at, let's say, a three-year-old child, a four-year-old child in their native language, in their native environment, and when I say native, I mean 
I'm not big on that word, but um, in the the uh, their first language environment, would you say that they're fluent? Because most kids start being able to speak at around two years old. They start being able to to blather on at around three years old. And by four years old, five years old, they're having full on conversations with their friends and their family. Now, would you say that they're fluent? And um, people would say, well, yeah, I guess so. But would you say that they speak with complexity? Well, no, not really. They don't have the same vocabulary that I do. Well, how about accuracy? How's their grammar? Do they make mistakes in grammar? Well, no, they still make mistakes in grammar. So how is it that these children who barely know how to hold a crayon and probably don't know very quickly the difference between a G and a Q and a P and a B and a D on site, okay, some might, how did they get to the point where you could look at them and say, well, that's a fluent four-year-old child. And what do they do that our students don't do, even though they, at least in Japan, uh, have studied English at least uh, since junior high school first grade, so three years of junior high school English, three years of high school English, so minimum six years of high school education. What can those four-year-old children, uh, first language speakers do that our students can't? And it made me want to research the topic. And um, that's where I started getting more information about how the literature and how academics actually talks about fluency. And it made one of the first things that I looked for was um, what is the definition of fluency? Where, where is there any kind of a mechanical definition of where you're fluent and I'm not? For example, yesterday I was um, I was working with my good friend Adam Jenkins and we wanted to make a video in Japanese to um, to to uh, do some PR work for an event that we're working on, and he obviously obviously spoke Japanese better than I did. And how would you say his fluency is higher than mine? And those were the questions that I was asking when I started looking at the Sefer. And for most of you, as you know, that the Sefer has six levels, and they start from A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, C2 being the highest, and A1 being the lowest. A1 to B1 have no mention of fluency. They have some targets. You know, you can say your own name. You can ask for locations of destinations, like where is the, where is the bathroom, that sort of thing, at that level. But flu fluency as an issue is not mentioned until you get to B2. And I've got it highlighted there in yellow. And you've got these long descriptions of what you should be able to do if you're a B2 level speaker. But in terms of fluency, it says you just have a degree of fluency. And when you move to C1, the definition is you can express ideas fluently. So generally, you know, you get an idea that, well, somebody has some fluency, but uh, a C1 speaker speaks fluently. C2 is very fluently. So you go from a little bit fluent, very fluent. You have all of these very exacting definitions in the rest of B2, C1, and C2. So that makes it very easy to tell your students, well, can you understand almost everything that you hear very quickly? Can you understand a wide range of demanding, longer clauses, recognize implicit meaning? Then, then you're a C1. But when it comes to fluency, it's all very, very vague. So when we're talking to kids about fluency and they're asking, well, Mr. Cruz, am I a C1 or a B2 or a C2? All you can do is just say, well, I kind of think you're a C1. It's a matter of feeling. Uh, not really that scientific. So I started asking myself, well, where do we go from there? And I asked myself again that question about those children who are four years old. Complexity is not the thing. Your ability to speak with really high level grammar, we know kids who have high level grammar, we've seen them take tests and they can do really, really well on a test, but they can't speak. So it's not necessarily complexity or your knowledge of complexity or your ability to actually use complexity in, in a, a conversation. Because even if you can speak with complex sentences, that doesn't mean that you're fluent. For example, a relative clause such as the one I'm about to use now spoken this way obviates the fact that whoever that was wasn't fluent. So I look at that and then I look at um, uh, com uh, 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 complexity and, and fluency and, uh, and, and those things 
should be separated, and fluency itself can be defined just by these two things. Can you speak quickly? And can you speak smoothly? Just those two things. Whether you speak with a lot of vocabulary or really difficult grammar, not really that important. Because this is the definition of a four-year-old child speaking. They speak quickly. And they speak smoothly. And that's what our kids can't do. What does that mean in terms of speed? Your speed, speed in your speaking, the speed in your responses, and the speed in your idea creation. So your ability to speak is important. So if you can actually patter off like this, that's really important. But then somebody asks you a question like, do you like ice cream? Uh, 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 and it takes you that long to come up with, yes, I love ice cream. Yeah, you can say it really quickly, but it takes too long for you to actually come up with a response or to come up with new ideas in case the conversation topic changes. Then your fluency is missing uh, a few important aspects in terms of speed. Smoothness. Can you control the pace between your words and sentences so you're not dealing with staccato bursts, with long pauses, or you're, 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 you're able to actually control so that then when you want to speak slowly and maybe have a dramatic pause, you can. But if you really want to speak quickly, then you can actually do that too, to a degree. I mean, all of us are professional speakers. We're, we're, we're instructors. So we know how to do dramatic pauses. We know how to, uh, to, to raise our voices and uh, not, I'm sorry, raise our, our speaking speed so that then that's effective. You don't need that in a normal uh, conversationalist, but that degree of control is important because that's what lends you to uh, be able to speak much more smoothly. There's a definition of speed. Now, I would like to emphasize that from here, these definitions are my own. They are hypothetical. They are not scientific. They are not based on data. I do not have the grant money, the budget money to actually be able to do a whole, get a whole bunch of thumb counters and, and count these students as they go. But my, my, my hypothesis is based on science that's been done before by linguists who've actually done the thumb counting and, and when you're talking about mean length runs, so actually measured disfluencies and uh, repetitions and uh, micro disfluencies and things like that. I came up with the idea that if you can speak to about 110, 120 words per minute, you have hit minimal level fluency. So you're no longer someone who struggles with words. You are talking something like at this pace which is a little bit slow, but believe it or not, this is about two words per second. You still pause between your sentences and sometimes you forget a word, but generally you can speak like this. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have a lot of students that can keep that up, even if it is just two words uh, per second, because the, um, the idea of a minimal 110, 120 words per minute requires you to actually be able to keep it up over time. So it's not like you just memorized a couple of sentences for a speech. Of course, that doesn't count. It has to be a spontaneous speech, a four or five minute um, monologue, not a speech, sorry. It has to be a spontaneous monologue. So if I ask you, hey, tell me what you had for dinner yesterday. Okay, did you cook it? You didn't cook it? And try to get them to speak and see if they can speak for five minutes at that pace, or maintain a 10 minute conversation at that pace, then they're hitting the, um, they're hitting the target that you wanna have. Us as um, expert level speakers are generally somewhere between 130 to 180 words per minute. The slowest of us, uh, according to the research that I've done, uh, is at about 130 words per minute. And that is what I would call almost annoyingly slow speakers. And 180 words per minute, that's actually me when I'm a little bit excited or I've had a little too much coffee. And those 130 words per minute, when I listen to that, I think, okay, I know you're a Canadian, I know you're an American, but I measure you out consistently at 130 words per minute. If anyone speaks any slower than that, I would think that there's something wrong or they really are second language learners. And if those second language learners fall below 100 words per minute, 110 words per minute, they're probably talking a little bit like this to you. That doesn't hit my definition of fluency for a couple of reasons. One, they're speaking too slowly, their words per minute is too slow, and they're not speaking smoothly. 
how do you speak, how do you measure smoothness? Well, there's a thing that linguists um, and uh, linguistics professors use uh, to measure that. It's called the mean length run. Now, I got to explain that to you. It's a technical term. The idea is that when you're measuring somebody's speaking, you put them through a five minute monologue, you put them through a, a 10 minute conversation, and you count the number of words that they can start from to the end until they hit a disfluency when they say something like, like, you know, um, uh, or they, 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 they repeat. So a micro repeat like that, or they repeat an entire sentence, or they, they, they come back to, or sometimes they do Trumpian things. You know, many people say that I don't really speak English very well. So those are disfluencies. Trump speaks with a ton of disfluencies. He probably would barely come up to, um, to uh, well, he, he's known to, to speak at a fourth grade level. His mean length runs are probably much shorter than someone who speaks very eloquently. Normally, mean length runs are measured in syllables. They want the linguists who measure this, measure them down to, to the tiniest amount that they can. But syllables are something that's very hard to sell to students. So I measure it out in words. If you can speak somewhere between 30 to 40 syllables, or actually 20, 28 to 35 syllables, then that means that you're achieving approximately the mean length run that you need to start being considered fluently. 25 to 35 syllables is approximately eight words. So I don't know about you, but I very rarely get students coming up to me at the end of the class saying, Mr. Cruz, is my homework due on Thursday? That's, or, that's eight words. Mr. Cruz, is my homework due on Thursday? Hardly ever get that because I don't have a lot of fluent students. That speed that I just spoke at was probably about 125, 130 words per minute. And the mean length run stretched out over eight words. None of them being very difficult words like immediately or expensive, you know, multi-syllable words, mostly two or three syllable words like that. So what is this thing that I call verbal classrooms and how do I use it to actually teach students to be able to achieve those two targets, speak more quickly, speak more smoothly? Because we all know that that's, you know, instinctively, that's what we want our students to do. But what do I do to actually get them to do that in an environment where they don't seem to mind, they do seem to enjoy it? So I want to talk about that a bit. Verbal classrooms, what is that exactly? So I'll, I'll just say it very quickly while you guys are reading that. It's, it's, a, it's an environment that I established from the very beginning where students don't have to worry so much about their complexity and about their accuracy. And all they're doing is making utterances. And it starts from very, very simple utterances from what I call the no-fail scenario where it's impossible for them to fail. They know every time when I ask them to do something from the very beginning, that it's something that they can do. And that confidence goes all the way through the class in every class. They know that they're never gonna be asked to do something that might embarrass them, or they're gonna encounter a word that they don't know how to pronounce because you're asking them to read you know, raw from the textbook. That sort of thing is nerve wracking. Uh, I think it's really important actually and no, this is something I'm going to put a lot of people through tonight, uh, to experience this yourself so you know what your students are actually doing and how they're feeling. So to go from these simple scaffolded utterances to the point where they get to more complex phrases and then on to independent conversations all within a 16-week semester. And each one of those um, classes in a 16-week semester being around 90 minutes, 100 minutes if you're in a 15-week semester, but approximately one university semester. That classroom environment is very, very important. If the students feel confident that this is a place where I'm, I'm not going to be embarrassed, this is a place where uh, I can actually practice speaking without having to worry about tests and quizzes too much, at least for this material, then it's something that they're, they're going to be able to take and, and grow with uh, through the semester itself. I also emphasize the idea that you guys should be able to speak to each other. You should be maximizing your face up speaking time. Instead of using the classroom time to like fill in the blanks or to read this passage before we discuss, to me, that's not really the best use of classroom time. Classroom time is when they're with their friends, they're when they're with their teachers. They should be active. 
Um, I love baseball analogies. And uh, one of the analogies I like to give is the idea that uh, when students, I'm sorry, when baseball players have to listen to the manager about strategy or they have to watch video about um, the next uh, pitcher or the next baseball player that, uh, that, they, that they're of the opponent they're going to play, yeah, that time is important. And the time that maybe they want to relax, reading about uh, baseball stories from a book, that's fine too. But when you get out onto the pitch, you warm up, you run, you do dashes between home plate and first base, then you hit the batting cage. Then once you're sufficiently warmed up, you play a few scrimmages. You do not waste the time on the pitch, watching video, singing songs about baseball, reading about baseball. You actually go to play baseball when you're on the pitch. And in the classroom, that's what we should be doing, I believe. We should not be spending so much time going over last week's quiz answers, um, filling in the blanks for this quiz. That stuff, you know, especially with digital delivery using language management, um, language management systems, learning management systems, that stuff can be done outside of the classroom. In the classroom, they talk to each other, they talk to the teacher. I'm now going to soon show you a video, but before I show you the video of me doing a verbal classrooms uh, environment, I want you to see, because it's not always clear, what's written on the, um, uh, on, the back, on, the, on the blackboard behind me. And it is basically the be verb conjugated in the present tense with those seven pronouns. Now you can see them in their order. It's I, you, he, she, it, we. And there is no uh, second person plural because the second person plural basically takes the second person singular. It doesn't need to be studied twice. I've actually found it to be confusing. They ask, why is that there? And so, well, that's a second person plural. And then you go, oh yeah, that. And then it's a waste of time. So I just show them that it's the second person is in a singular form. So here's a video of me teaching uh, verbal classrooms. So let me just explain. I'm going to be showing a couple of videos from this demonstration class. And this demonstration class is on my YouTube channel if you want to watch the entire two-hour demonstration class. The reason why demonstration class was recorded was because one of the people that I spoke to about my initial research into fluency was a professor at, um, at a national university here in the city um, at the uh, Kyushu Institute of Technology. His name is Professor Robert Long. And he researches fluency too. And he gave me my first start on where I should be researching in fluency. And he's one of the people that told me, well, in terms of a mechanical definition of fluency, Jose, um, linguists can't decide where it is that you can say that this person is fluent. And so that number of 110, 120 words, there's a lot of debate around that. And I just said, I just put my foot down and said, okay, I'll make my own definition because they can't decide amongst themselves. He was writing... Um, some research on fluency and wanted me to make a website for him. He noticed that I actually have a teaching system that teaches fluency. So I decided, hey, actually, why don't we spend some of that grant money and, and do a demonstration class so we can show other people how to teach fluency, not just hope for it, not just go, well, you know, if you study hard enough, if you take enough tests, you'll become fluent one day, but to teach it directly. So uh, we did an entire two-hour demonstration class, and this is about the first five minutes. Now, granted, that demonstration class is trying to crush about two-thirds of an entire semester to one very small class, but the students that were in it didn't know what was coming. Two of them had taken my class before, but they hadn't taken it a long time, so most of the classroom itself had no idea what I was about to teach. So, uh, let me make sure that, uh, yep, you guys can hear the video good. My teacher wrote this up for it, me. Oh gosh, no, what is that? That's uh, 46 years ago? Holy cow. Okay, uh, when I first went to Canada and, and one day she said, Jose, stand up, say all of this in a big, loud, fast voice. And I would stand up and I would say, I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. Very good, two times, faster, louder. I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. Now, I bet if I asked one of you right now to do that, you couldn't. And you are university students who've studied English for six years. Just goes to show you, all the studying you do doesn't get you ready for speaking. So we're gonna speak today. First thing we're gonna do, I want you to turn around in your chairs 90 degrees Turn around, 90 degrees. Turn around and face your partner on that side. Just, no, turn around in your chair. Yeah, just turn around in your chair. You don't have to turn the chair. 
Just turn around in your chair. Good, okay, there you go. Good, okay. And this is what we're gonna do. I'm going to show you how to do this with you. Okay. Take it from the first line, somebody, when I say ready, go, first line, okay. you will, I, I'll go with I am, you'll begin with you are, and I'll continue with he is, she is, and we'll continue from there. When we get to the bottom, we go back to the top. Ready? I'll start. I am. Uh, you are. He is. She. It is. Look at me. Look at me. Are. They are. I am. You are. He is. She is. It is. We are. They are. I am. You he are. is. She it is. We are. Did it over here, over here, over here. <laughs> Very difficult, yeah? Yes. But it looks so easy, yeah? Because yeah. looking at something in English, studying it on paper is nowhere near as difficult as looking at somebody in the eyes. So it's okay, if you want to look at this, go ahead, take a look. You can check the order, you can check whatever it is you want, but when you speak to a person, learn to go from paper to a person's eyes. Look all you want, but when your mouth moves, you go back to the person. Okay, when I say ready, go, somebody begins. Look at your partners. Ready, go. When we go on through these demonstration videos, I'll show how I get them to actually change their partners so they're not always sitting with the same person every time. And that story that I told at the beginning, um, I actually did experience all of that. I, when I first went to Canada as a boy, I was nine years old, I didn't speak English. Uh, I'm Filipino by birth. And Filipinos and Filipinas, of course, um, study English starting from grade four. I was about 10 years old or 11 years old, sometimes we were young, nine years old. But I was still in grade three when we immigrated to Canada, hadn't yet um, taken the education that my sisters and my parents had already taken. And that's why they were fluent in English. And I was the last one to learn how to speak. Now, I was, of course, inundated by English because it was always on the radio, it was always on TV. My sister spoke it to each other sometimes, but I did not yet have the chance to speak. So in Canada, uh, Canada being really, really famous for second language uh, teaching, um, put me into a classroom. And that story that I told about my teacher saying, okay, let's practice this verb, that actually happened to me. And that's, that's, a, true, um, that's a true story. And that experience actually instructed uh, the way that I learned French, the way that I learned uh, Japanese, uh, the reason why I realize now that I did not succeed in learning how to speak French very well is because what I did in Japanese and what I unconsciously did in English, I never did in French. Now, from that very, very, very simple first step, if you go through an unhindered verbal classrooms curriculum, by the time you get to week 13 or week 14, when these kids are about to go into their testing, their assessment, they will start to look like this. So you can see the same sort of sitting pattern that they're doing, and they're, they're uh, practicing their independent conversations first in pairs, and then eventually in groups. But this class, uh, their TOEIC was approximately 470, 450. Of course, there's a range in between. One of the students in there was actually closer to about 610, but she didn't do very well on her placement test, so she ended up in this class. Some were lower. Uh, but most of the students that I get go through this semester, and they end up like this. And you can see that they're animated, that they're gesturing, that they're joking with each other. They're not looking at notes. There are no notes in my, in my classroom. They're probably, their accuracy probably sucks. Their complexity is low, but they are talking to each other. They're talking to each other with the English that they have. But with the English that they have, they realize this person understands me. Holy cow, I, I really can speak English. Badly, but I can speak English. And that kind of confidence is what builds the next step up to when they go, well, maybe if I really do study just a bit more vocabulary, I'll be better in my next class. But creating that uh, confidence where they actually, without you hovering over them, without them having to read something from a piece of paper from a textbook and, and, and communicate with another person, that's what I think verbal classrooms excels at. Uh, before we um, continue 
uh, Rhea, Anika, are, are there any? I haven't been watching the chat. I'm sorry, everyone. I don't always watch the chat. But uh, is this a good time to ask if anyone has any questions in in the uh, in the audience? Does anyone want to raise their hand or just open up their microphones? Or were there any questions in the chat, Annika, Rhea, that I might have missed? Um, well, we were no. just putting banter in and agreeing yeah. with you mostly. Okay. <laughs> I agree with you. Lots of agreements with what you said, but no questions but yet. Good point to ask questions if anyone has any. Sure. Yeah. Questions? Actually, I, I have a question. So sure. it looks like you don't have a book, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, were there issues around you not having a book? Oh, yeah. Oh, I got a lot of feedback, feedback, <laughs> pushback on that uh, um, at some schools, but eventually I've proved myself. And um, what students hate is when they're assigned a textbook and this guy doesn't want to use it because they were forced to put out like the, the approximate value of 15 American dollars to buy a book. And I'm telling them, I don't think it's going to help you. Okay, I want to do this instead. So they don't like it at the start, but then they realize what we did through the first or through those 16 weeks actually did help them more than studying the book one more time. But if it's my curriculum and I'm the one allowed to say whether there's, whether there's a textbook or not, the students love that. They don't have to spend another $15 on yet another Akaiwa, I'm sorry, Akaiwa, another English conversation textbook that they bought similar to the one uh, last year. And this time they can actually... Um, uh, just speak and speak and speak. Now, if you do have a textbook and you must teach from it because there are grammar quizzes or there are there is a, a common test that you have to hit certain grammar points, I can show how to use this system within those parameters. It's very easy to do. But in my way of teaching it, no, I want to show them. And this is part of the speech that I give them at the beginning of the semester is that you guys know plenty of English. You have so much English in your head that you probably don't even know it. What your problem is that it gets stopped right here, right about your teeth. It's all in here and it has no flow going out in terms of communication. And the only way that you can actually increase that flow is just to practice. It's just like sports. You'll probably notice on my Blackboard as these um, demonstration videos go through that I write up very quickly. Language is like sports that everything that you do in sports in terms of training, in terms of uh, attacking certain muscles, learning certain skills, that's what language teaching is. It's not about learning more knowledge. It's about garnering and improving skills. So yeah, I don't use um, paper, uh, Anika, but it can be incorporated very, very easily. I had to do it this semester a lot. Any other questions? I see Adam has a question there on the platform. No chat. Mr. Jenkins. Thank you very much, Mr. Cruz. Uh, there's, uh, I, I was wondering, you know, you had the, on the blackboard, uh, I, you, he, she, it, we, they, mm -hmm. uh, I am, you are, he, or she is, et cetera, et cetera. But mm -hmm. when you switch to the independent conversations later in the semester, what's on the board then? Uh, okay. Let me see if I can just jump to that. I actually had a very interesting moment today. Uh, just before I went to go do this presentation, I was just running around Facebook for a little bit and I thought I'd kill a bit of time. And what I noticed on Facebook was actually this. It gave me a Facebook memory. About 12 years ago, on this day, as I was preparing these students for independent conversations, that is normally what I would have on the board. So it says there, cruise, as in, that's me, you're going to be talking about me, or I actually don't remember exactly why my name is up there. But the, the rule is you have to speak randomly. That question mark, that means that you can use questions right now, but later on, I'll be telling you to use no questions. That five means I want you to speak for five minutes at a time. And they were, they were speaking like that, like that second video for five minutes. The topics that they were uh, using are over there on the right, Japan, family, sports, TV, music, food. Uh, what's the other one there? Um, university, shopping, America, high school. My topics are not going to be things like um, climate change or world peace or SDG number five. Uh, I don't really want to talk about that with them at this point. If they don't have the ability to strike up 
a very quick conversation about your family with this with this American that they just met. So we start with very simple topics. All I want you to do is speak quickly, speak in, into a person's eyes, speak uh, with a strong voice. Those are my real targets. It's not about complexity or accuracy. Never really is. Thank you. Can I can I follow up with one more? Um, so before you actually get them to do that independent conversation, do you sort of start the engines by I don't know, doing a little bit of the more controlled stuff like you had uh, in the week one classes? Do you do a bit of that before the independent conversations or how do you open that class? So that first video that I did, that was the first five minutes of just about, well, I shouldn't say the first five minutes. The first half hour, of course, I'm just like any of you. I have to talk about the curriculum and the syllabus and, and penalties for late assignments and all of that takes the first, first half hour. Then we go on to what I want to do in the class. So by about 40 minutes in, 45 minutes in, I'm finally able to say, okay, well, this is the way that I teach. So let's try this. And then I get to where I was demonstrating with that kid with the glasses. From that point in the first class until week 13, which is about where you saw those kids in the second video, which I will return to now, uh, those kids in the second video um, here, whoops, here, okay, there was a whole bunch of stuff that I'm going to be showing you um, progressively towards the rest of this uh, presentation. And, and, and I want to show as well, and this is why I said plus alpha, I want to show how you can incorporate that with your textbooks. And I want to show for the people who have seen, maybe I think a couple of people here have seen this presentation before, how to do this in a different way uh, and uh, be able to take away some information that you might not have seen in, in other presentations. But there is a lot of stuff in between the first week and week 13, week 14. Cool. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay. So here we were. I have I a quick question, to... if you don't mind. Sure. Um, how much L1 do you use or demonstrate your knowledge of? It From the video, it looks like you weren't speaking any Japanese. Do you let them know that you speak Japanese? Do you give classroom management in Japanese, or is it totally in English? How does it work with that for you? The reason why I did the demonstration video entirely in English was because I wanted to show, for example, in Japan, we have these um, people who are hired by the government or by local boards of education called uh, assistant language teachers who very often don't speak uh, 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 Japanese in any degree, like they cannot speak Japanese. And they are, in a sense, limited that they can't use, they literally cannot speak any other language in the classroom. It's not by choice. But sometimes even some people who can speak some Japanese think, well, I want to be able to do this all in English. Okay, well, that's me doing it all in English. It can be done all in English. However, I will tell you that when I teach my classes, unless it's a very high level class, a, a class that can, that can prove to me that I don't have to hold back my, my L1, which is English, I will teach in Japanese, entirely in Japanese, not just my classroom management. All of my instruction is in Japanese. It's all in L1. Theory behind it is this. It's a fairly unique teaching style. And if you don't explain clearly some of the more sort of subtle coaching sort of things that you want them to see, like you're looking down, I know you're thinking, but if, you, if you're going to learn anything, you got to look up and think while you're looking at a person's eyes. That's actually hard to explain if you're not doing it in L1. And I want to maximize their speaking time in L2, which means that if I can get these instructions done in L1 very quickly, and they know what the instructions are, and there's no confusion because it's done in L1, then they can go straight to the, to the exercise itself. There's no confusion. There's no negotiation um, where they're saying to each other in Japanese, I don't get what he said. Is this what he said? Is this what we're supposed to do? None of that. They know exactly what to do. They go straight into it because I explained it in Japanese. So the truth is, I normally teach in Japanese. But when I before, when I couldn't speak Japanese, I was teaching this all in English. So I can do either way. It can be done either way. Last little thing. Do you ever also point out to them that it's a cultural difference with a language difference? Like eye contact is more common in this language. And then it allows them to kind of separate and distance themselves and reattach themselves that way. I found that it works in Korean. I just wonder if you've used it as well. 
I don't know if I worry so much about the, there, there probably is like a degree of difference in terms of eye contact and, you know, being very direct and your chest all puffy and say, hey, I'm American, come listen to me, kind of cultural difference um, in terms of how language is spoken for Japanese people and for native uh, English speakers. But I do notice, and they recognize it themselves, that without thinking very much about it, they start thinking about English and their eyes start floating up to the roof and they completely forget about looking at their partners. So that whole thing, I've never paused to think about, is there a cultural sort of difference that I should address? But generally to me, it's just so obvious that they're not looking at each other and they know it themselves that um, I, at every chance I get, I tell them, go look at that person's eyes, say it. And what will happen is naturally, they're forced to look into each other's eyes as much as possible in my classroom. And then when they leave my classroom and they are speaking the language in a natural situation and they're left to their own devices, it improves their eye contact. So it's never going to be exactly as, you know, I don't want them to learn how to stare into the camera like this, that's kind of creepy. But what they learned in my classroom improves their eye contact through their natural conversation opportunities. Okay. So, I want to show everyone that I do realize that this is not necessarily everyone's cup of tea. There are advantages and disadvantages. First, let's look at them for the students. Students, especially in Japan, know what they want. And for the ones who have been put through the system and are intelligent about it, but realize, well, what I want to do is graduate this university and get a good job because that's what social pressure tells me I should need to do. And they look at what I'm teaching and immediately they think, well, this isn't at all what I expected. Where's the textbook? Aren't we going to be studying tests? This isn't going to help me for TOEIC. So you have to explain to them, yes, you're quite right, but this is going to help you learn how to speak. Well, speaking isn't very important, is it? No, you're wrong. Speaking is extremely important. Uh, in Japan, we're starting to move towards um, assessment, common assessment tests that have a speaking section incorporated into it. TOEIC has uh, always been talking and has not yet completely implemented the idea of a, a speaking section in its tests. Um, there's another famous test uh, in Japan called the STEP test, the um, Society for Testing English Proficiency, also known in Japan called Aiken, that uh, has always had uh, an English speaking section in it. Uh, and, um, and eventually uh, learning how to speak English is something that might've been shunted a couple of decades ago, but now is going to become more and more important. And it's far easier to convince students that learning how to speak English is as important as being able to get a high score in a test. But the advantages are much more numerous. Um, it addresses the real speaking skills. And students are, it's common for students to come up to me at the end of class and say, Mr. Cruz, I didn't quite get what you were doing at the start of the semester, but boy, I'm really glad I took your class. And um, they realize that now this is maximizing their speaking time. And, um, and a lot of the things that you were uh, you know, encountering before about shyness and stuff, a lot of that goes out the window. That first student that I had, uh, in that first video, who was kind of shy, redis reticent, and you could tell he was hesitating. I'm almost kind of glad that he was the first student because it made it obvious in the demonstration that this works with even shy students, with hesitant students, not just the really good outgoing students. There are, of course, advantages and disadvantages for the teachers as well. Let's take a look at them. Um, you will be drained at the end of every class until you get used to this. Till you get used to this and you know exactly what's coming up, you're constantly focusing, your, your, your antenna are up uh, because you know that you have to watch these students get a real uh, feel for their pulse. Maybe they're not uh, very uh, uh, energetic today because most of these kids are baseball players and on Sunday, and today's Monday morning, Sunday they had a big game and they're all exhausted. You have to know that because you're asking them to put out a lot of physical energy and you will be asked to put out a lot of physical energy as well. Um, the advantages, however, number one, you're going to do a lot less marking if you're focusing mostly on verbal classrooms, okay? And it is a viable method for people who are not necessarily what are called native English speakers. You just need to be fluent. 
my definition of fluent is as it was. So you're able to speak up better than 130 words per minute. You have fairly smooth speaking. Maybe you make a couple of mistakes here and there, but in terms of being able to explain to these students as a Japanese teacher of English or a Korean teacher of English, then you're able to explain to them in their native language. This is why it's important that we do it this way. So there are advantages and disadvantages for this. The targets are here. You want to maximize their speaking speed, okay, and their output quantity. So, in in Japanese baseball, there's an expression that you have to hit a you have to do a thousand hits before you can actually start improving to the next level. So, the next thousand hits in the batting cage is your next target. How many thousands of hits have you actually done in the batting cage? You set the focus on getting their fluency up and then adding to their vocabulary and then working on um, uh, their grammar, extending that grammar so that then they know all of those grammatical or those grammatical uh, points that they know they can actually start using in their speaking. And that those grammatical targets and those vocabulary targets, even if you study really hard and you do get a high score on that test, that's going to go one ear and out the other. And you have, you, when I say that, you, it's you, the teacher, and you, the student, you have experienced it. You studied really hard for that test, and now I bet you can't remember even 25% of that entrance exam uh, stuff that you memorized before because you have no basis to internalize any of that information. And the only way to truly internalize it is to actually make it, um, uh, to bring automaticity as uh, some researchers would say, to your speaking. This is why we all know our vocabularies because we've used it dozens of times or hundreds of times or in terms of certain words, thousands of times. Those kids will study a word, never utter it once. Now, I would like to get, uh, let's see, how many people here? 14 people uh, to actually try this for themselves because you can look at this and say, oh, wow, that's kind of interesting. But you know, that's just kind of a drill, isn't it? That's not very hard, is it? I want you to try it. And there are, actually, let me take a look at the participants list. There are a couple people who maybe, oh, four people at least, who've seen this before. So those people will um, sort of be ringers. But for a lot of people, you've never done this. And this is what I want you to do, OK? Here is that list of. Uh, pronouns and the be verb. Now, come on, you're all English teachers. You don't have to see this. You should know what this is and how it goes. But I'm going to put you into breakout rooms. Oh, I'm sorry. Annika is going to put you into breakout rooms. So, Annika, we have, um, let's see, there's me. Did you want to try this yourselves, Rhea and Annika? Sure. Okay. So uh, make sure that you make enough rooms for everyone. There are uh, there were 14. Oh, somebody left. <laughs> somebody ran right before the demonstration. Um, so they're going to be without me 12 people. So six rooms. So there are going to be two people in each one. Okay. And uh, be sure to jump into the one that um, you can go into. And I would like you to make the breakout rooms for two minutes. Okay. And people should go in there automatically. They shouldn't have to push a button and they'll go in. The first one is going to be for two minutes because you know, getting in there the first time, um, you're kind of unsure, but here are the instructions, okay? Once you go in there, you're gonna start right away. And I'm gonna give you a demonstration, but um, the reason why it's two minutes is because it's the first time, after that, it'll be much shorter. But I would like to demonstrate, as I did with that uh, student, uh, to you, and I would like a volunteer. Uh, would anyone like to volunteer like that? Oh, Rhea would like to volunteer, so Rhea. Just like I did with that kid, okay, I'm going to start with I am. You'll respond with you are, and we're going to try to go as quickly as we possibly can. Now, Zoom has a bit of a time lag, but it seems like everyone is um, pretty much on time here, and we shouldn't take too long between utterances. Once we get to the bottom, we go up to the top until I tell us to stop. Okay? Okay. Okay, here we go. I am. You are. He is. He is. It is. We are. They are. I am. You are. Yes. She is. It is. We are. I need my cheat sheet. You we are. are. <laughs> <laughs> like, ah, we are. So I often do that with students just to get them to know that the next time Cruz might actually pull the blackboard. So I better focus. Mm. A lot of the time when I'm, I noticed this early on in the pandemic, I would leave the slide up all the time. And the kids were just kind of reading it and they weren't putting any effort into internalizing. 
So once you pull the rug out from under them, they realize, oh my God, he's going to do it again in the next one. And so at least the person who's doing the demonstration is focused on the next slide. But I will share that slide into the breakout rooms because it's the very first one. However, everyone have a little bit of pride. It is the B verb conjugated in the present tense with the seven pronouns. Okay. I, you, he, she, it, we, they. Does anyone have any questions before we go into breakout rooms? No? Okay, it's going to be for two minutes. Okay, I'll let you go in there. Uh, Annika and Rhea, are you both going to go in yourselves? And uh, yeah, I'll wait up here uh, for everyone to come back. Okay? Okay, so Annika, up to you. Throttle them in. All right, rooms are created and open. Oh, yeah. Sorry, shall I shut down the breakout yeah, rooms? Yeah, just two, I only wanted them to go for two minutes. Yay. Thanks a lot. Yay. Yay. I did. Oh, Kinsella's here. Wow. A lot of Jolt people. Awesome. Kinsella, nice to see you. <laughs> uh, how was that? Anyone like to comment? Yeah. Okay. So let's get back to work. No more sloughing off. That was the start. The B verb. Remembering those pronouns is hard, but you just keep on going. How about a B verb with an adjective? I'm sleepy. You are sleepy. He is sleepy. She is sleepy. How about negation? I am not hungry. And just keep on going. Right? How about the past tense? I was in Osaka. You were in Osaka. Osaka is a city in Japan. I want to do another breakout room, this time with this. Okay, And you'll find that when you're trying to go fast, something that looks really simple, like I was in Osaka last week, you were in Osaka last week, he was in Osaka last week, will leave you tongue-tied by the time you get to about we. Because very naturally, your mouth starts to get tired. That's hard enough for us as, as, as expert speakers of the language, but that fatigue of making these sounds with your tongue and with your with your cheeks that you're not used to as a second language speaker can actually trip you up by around the 15th or 20th minute of a class. So I would like another demonstration partner who would like to uh, to uh, to volunteer. Adam. Was that I don't know if that was like, hey, I was in Osaka last week. Okay. Okay. Ready? Oh, you were in Osaka last week? He was in Osaka last week. No, no, no. I was, no, no, no. I was actually asking. So, okay. I was, I was doing some small talk. Sorry. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. I was in Osaka last week. You were in Osaka last week? He was in Osaka last week. She was in Osaka last week. It was in Osaka last week. We were in Osaka last week. We were in Osaka last week. I was in Osaka last week. You were in Osaka last week. <laughs> he was in Osaka last week. See? See? I told you. Yeah. It gets harder and harder and harder just because it's getting longer and longer. And look at this. Okay. We're not yet. We're not yet at eight words. I was in Osaka last week. We're at six words. Okay? Mm. And it's starting to trip you up. Mm. And really, when was the last time you had uh, a student come up to you and say, I was in Seoul last week with that kind of smoothness, with that kind of speed. So let's try this. Okay. Um, Anika, can you set this one up this time for one minute? Okay, and I actually didn't give the clear instructions that I should have given. The first one who lands in the room takes the first sentence. The second one who lands in the room with no negotiation, you know that there's already somebody there. They're going to go first. You're going to go second. If we end up for some reason with three people, let's just go A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C in a circle. Okay. Okay. Anika, are we ready to go? Yes. And rooms are you threw me in a room. Okay, well, that's okay, Greg. Uh, right. I, I can't share the screen. I will, I'll try to share the screen. I can only share the screen in here. Uh, it's okay, we can do it without it. It's, it's, oh, I oh see actually, it you know what? I can leave. You and Mary, go ahead. All right. Okay, got it. Okay, Mary. Okay. I, guess, I guess I was in first, so I was in Osaka well, last week. You were in Osaka last week. He was in Osaka last week. She was in Osaka last week. It, it was in Osaka last week. We were in Osaka last week. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to send you to a room. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I got I to gotta get this share back. Oh, ah. okay. No problem, though. There you go. Good. Okay. 
I have the timer on. I think I, I hope I hope it went no, off. Last time, last time it was at two, but we're probably at 30 seconds, maybe 40 seconds now. So probably within 15 or 20 seconds. Oh, okay. Oh, um, yeah. Close now. Close all rooms. Close okay. All. I like that feature. I haven't seen that. Like the screen sharing to the breakout rooms. Yeah. Yeah. It's um. It's a checkbox that's right. In, it's in the bottom left of the screen sharing palette. It's oh. the third checkbox that's been there since about February or so. Oh my god, that would have saved me so much. Yeah. I I heard I heard somebody wrote a book. <laughs> what did I miss? What was in there since February? Uh, well, I'll show you just really quickly here. Um, so let's see here. When you share, there are two checkboxes down here. Put that down, put that down. There are two checkboxes down here. When there are breakout rooms running, there's another checkbox that says share to breakout rooms. So if you want to share to all of the breakout rooms, your slide while you're sitting up at the top in um, in a meeting while others are in breakout rooms, you can share that sort of thing. Okay, now let me get back to what we were doing. Does anyone have any questions so far? You can just make this longer and longer. Now you're at nine words for a concert. Now this gets harder, okay? And you know, uh, this is probably way about week two because they're just throwing this at each other. You can start doing future tense. You can start doing uh, potentials like I can swim 50 meters, you know? Uh, I can make a carbonara pasta, something like that. Or, or future tense, I will be in Osaka next week. You can practice all of this. And that's hard enough. That's plenty hard enough. But the real jewel in the crown to verbal classrooms is something that I call the AQP, because at least for Japanese students, being able to master English question grammar is really hard. It's based on French question grammar, which is involved, which involves basically um, a switching of position between the verb and the subject. We all know this, we do it instinctively, but for them to do it is really, really hard. As easy as it is to explain, it's really hard to get to the point where it's auto absolutely automatic. So this is me demonstrating the AQP with a regular verb, like go, okay? But we're gonna practice it with something simpler, but watch this video for two things. For when I ask them to switch seats, so they're gonna be moving uh, in this sort of snake-like pattern around the room, and watch how I do the explanation for what I call the answer question pattern. That's what AQP means, answer question pattern. Hang on to that and I'll define it for you after we watch this video. First, I want to make sure that I've got this optimized. Yeah. Okay, here we go. I have a very crazy way of doing this practice. Person starts at I go. When you make the question, you make it with the subject next in order. So if your answer was I go, your question will use you. I go, do you go? Your answer to this question uses the same subject, which then takes the next subject. This question uses this answer, which then takes the next subject, and so on and so on. It looks hard, but actually, once you start doing it, it starts getting pretty easy. Well, let's take this slowly. Do you have any questions, dear? I just okay. want to say to everyone, she was I about go, a TOEIC 600 go. at this point. I go, do you go? Uh, you go, does he go? Good. He goes, does she go? She goes, do we go? Next one after she. Uh, does it go? It goes, do we go? We go, do they go? They go, do I go? I, you go. Um, they go, do I go? I go, do you go? You go, does he go? He goes, does she go? Very good. Do your best. Ready? Go! I go, do you go? I go, do you go? I go, do you go? 
I think he was trying to keep his brain from falling out of his head at that point. Watch how they switch. They're going to move to the next seat to their left. And at the bottom of the row, they just move to the seat across. At the top of the row, they just okay. switch around up at the top. Okay. If you need now to they look, have you new partners, look. and I always you have speak, speak randomly the right. next demonstration. I go, do you go? You go, does he go? He goes, does she go? She goes, does it, uh, does it go? It goes, do we go? Uh, we go, da, do they go? Good, do your best. Ready, go! I go, do you go? You go, does he go? And I know that some of you are probably thinking, really, Jose, you just say ready, go, and they all automatically start talking. In 25 years of teaching this to some of the best students, some of the lowest level students, some of the most enthusiastic students, and maybe less motivated students, every time on the first exercise, I say ready, go, they go. I haven't really understood completely what Pavlovian phenomenon is at play here. When I say go, they go. So that was with a regular verb, go, which of course is more difficult because it uses the auxiliary verb do for the question. Let's do something a little bit easier. Let's go back to be, okay? I am, are you, you are, is he. So as I said before, you start from the same I am, no um, adjectives or anything else, no um, object uh, phrases, just the, the subject and the verb, I am, are you, okay? So whatever you said at the start as a subject, next in order will be your question. I am, and I's next subject is you, so I am, are you. You answer that question with the same subject that you were asked with. So you don't say, are you, I am, that'll just keep going in a circle. So you were asked with you, so you answer with you. You are, is he? He is the question subject, so you answer with he. Okay, I've heard from Adam and I've heard from Rhea. Who's next? Just open Lindsay. Up. Lindsay. Oh. Greg. Oh no, uh, you're you're being volunteered. Okay, no, 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 no. nothing like I'll that. Oh, Kinsella. Oh, Lindsay. Lindsay's here. Open up her with mic. A very cool background. Oh, she closed her mic. Give it a try. I don't okay. mind being volunteered. <laughs> Do you have any questions, Lindsay? Uh, I don't. Do you? Oh, oh good. Oh, that's oh <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, here we go. Let's let's see if you're still giggling at the end of this. Okay, here we are. I am. Are you? You are. Is he? He is. Is she? She is. Is it? It is. Are we? We are. Are they? They are. Am I? You are, oh shoot. Am I? Oh. Am I? Okay, so I, I asked you. I am, am. I? are you? You are, is he? He is, is she? She is, is it? It is, are we? Good. That moment of hesitation that you're feeling right now because you're trying to keep up with this pattern, this, 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 this um, decided pattern is one tenth of what these kids will be doing. Now you could be saying, yeah, but that's just memorizing a pattern. Yes, but it creates that sense of automaticity that they have to struggle with and you're feeling their struggle right now. So I would like everyone to sort of feel what that struggle feels like. So Annika, one more time with the breakout room, same basic thing, one minute, throw everybody in there. And um, I'm gonna end up in a breakout room, but I'll leave right away and I'll get that uh, slide back up there so everyone can see them in the breakout rooms. Annika, anytime. Welcome back, everyone. By the way, I wanted to mention, uh, normally I give this presentation to um, instructors that work primarily in Japan. And some of you from Korea might not have recognized that a couple of those kids were all going, muzukashi, muzukashi, ah, muzukashi. In Japanese, that means, oh, so difficult. Whoa, that's a toughie, would uh, be the, um, the translation. So they're all remarking how difficult it was. At the same time, they were all doing it, executing it quite well. 
So at first in their heads, they're going to be going, oh my God, I can't do this. But eventually they can, because it's just like everything else. If you apply enough time to it, the solution provides itself because it's really just a matter of improving a skill. From there, I would work on do, the verb do, because that's so key to so many things. If you don't know how to use do in a question, you can't go on to regular verbs. Have itself can, can function as a, uh, as, as a grammatical verb, uh, but when it's just about something that you have, something that you own, then it does use the auxiliary verb do. From there, once we've mastered that and we've done that for maybe about a week or two, okay, and this becomes um, really, really instinctual for them, then we start getting to the point where we can start doing more complex sentences. There's a very complex sentence to begin with, and I wouldn't introduce this until about the fifth week. But you look at that with the possessive pronoun, I have Netflix on my phone. Do you have Netflix on your phone? Explaining the possessive pronoun is easy. Getting them to actually use it easily in a conversation is incredibly difficult. And you'll find that for yourself if you actually do this demonstration with me. I'm going to do another demonstration. I'm going to do another breakout room, so I need a, a demonstration partner for this. Anybody else want to volunteer? Oh, Greg. Yep. Okay, now this time you don't have the subject list in front of you, but you should have it fairly well memorized. On the board, what I usually write is just the subject I with an arrow leading down to they, and that usually reminds them there are all the uh, other subject uh, pronouns that are in there. So use them all to cycle through this until you get to day, then go back to I. You okay? I think so. I have Netflix on my phone. Do you have Netflix on your phone? Do you have Netflix on? No, no, no. answer me. Yes, I, I have Netflix on my phone. No, no, no. Okay, so I asked you you, so you have to answer me with you. Do you have Netflix on your phone? Uh, no, that was my question. Okay, let's start again. Let's start at the top, okay? Okay. I have Netflix on my phone. Do you have Netflix on your phone? Give me an answer. You have Netflix on your phone? Keep going. Does he have Netflix on his phone? He has Netflix on his phone. Does she have Netflix on her phone? She has Netflix on her phone. Does it have Netflix on its phone? It has Netflix on its phone. Do we have Netflix on our phones? We have Netflix on our phones. Do they have Netflix on their phones? Good. There you go. Now, uh, getting tight for time. So you know what? Thank you for the demonstration, but I'm not going to throw you in breakout rooms. You guys can imagine what a brain bender that. I'm glad Greg got the hard one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Now, now I know to ask you for the next one. Okay. And you can go on with that. Okay. Now, this actually does not require um, a subject verb change because the subject is always grandfather. So the verb is always remains as plays, but the possessive pronoun and the object pronoun will change. And these kids hardly ever have a chance to cycle through these object pronouns. Me, you, him, her, it, us, them. To, for them, they know that and they can probably fill it in. They fill it in if they think about it for a second, but you don't have that. Sorry, kind of... where's the grandfather in the place? Oh, my, there we go. Yeah. My grandfather. Oops. Okay. Sorry. I double clicked on it. Whoops. Sorry. 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 He made me, <laughs> he made me double click on it. Uh, there it is. Grandfather right there. So it's my grandfather, your grandfather, but the actual conjugation will never change. It's always plays and play does in the question. When was the last time you were able to easily teach the reflexive pronoun? I can do it myself. Can you do it yourself? Sometimes I lay little traps for them in terms of um, single articles. And as I did with, we have Netflix on our phones. So that becomes instinctual for you because you know that that plural is there. But for a lot of these students, especially Japanese students, I don't know about Koreans, but um, the plural is very, very hard to teach to these kids as a matter of automatic response. And being able to show them that's something that you have to keep in mind is really, really important. So when I teach speed, I get them to actually say those as quickly as they can. But being able to teach something smoothly, you need a fairly long sentence to do that. So here's the next uh, video that I want to show you. What are the difference? I'm going to the 
is my sister. Do you live in the future with our sister? And you see them start to freak out because <laughs> they realize just how hard this is. Yes. So let's review. I, my, you, your, he, his, she, uh, it, it's now, especially that S. If that S is not there, it changes the meaning. We, our, they, they. I live in Kitakyushu with my sister. Do you live in Kitakyushu with your sister? You live in Kitakyushu with your sister. With your sister. This fluency. Does he live in Pause. With the Pause. Good. Very good. But again, come back to this part. <laughs> so I'm just going to pause that for a second so that we can see that on the board there. Okay. Where it reads is one idea, one breath. And that's actually the name of this slide. So I get them to go through all of these things like, um, my grandfather plays tennis with me. Very easy for us to say, of course, because we're English teachers. For them to say it, they end up saying something like this. My grandfather plays tennis with me. They're doing their best, but it's still not automatic. And a lot of that is psychological. It's not that they don't know the words. Some Sometimes that sort of stopping comes from a lack of experience. So I tell them to focus on your breathing. Focus on your breathing. Make sure you have a strong enough breath and enough wind to actually say that whole sentence. A lot of these kids, they're, they're so nervous, they forget to actually breathe, and then they just lose their breath in the middle of the sentence. Take a deep breath. Control your breathing from the very beginning of the sentence all the way out. Make sure that you're actually expelling breath all the way through. That's what one idea, one breath means. And it takes a long time to get them to do it. it. Takes a lot of demonstrations, a lot of demonstrations that you do with different kinds of students, not just the good ones. And you, you can praise the good ones, but you want to praise especially the ones who've been trying really hard and have shown marked improvement. Not necessarily the ones who always just get it perfect, but the ones who are showing marked improvement. This is probably the single longest sentence I've ever impromptu thrown at students. It says, I like watching Blu-rays at home more than going to the cinema. Believe it or not, after about 10 minutes, about 75% of my class was able to push that out with pretty good fluency and pretty good smoothness. Because they were able to focus entirely on the answer and the question, how about you? How about him? How about her? was something that they could just spiel off very quickly, three words. Now, normally at this point, I start talking about um, going to independent conversations by doing something called the switch. But I wanted to show something else this time around that I have found some pretty good success with uh, in my classes this semester, because I wanted to mix things up. And it's something called the word throw. Adam has seen this before, and I think he's tried it in some of his classes. Not everyone has seen it before, though. So after maybe, you know, after a few sentences like this, or um, I have another um, keynote slideshow that I, I wanted to show you, uh, I believe, is it still here? Oh, no, I closed it. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to show it to you later. But after a few sentences like this, or a few sentences like this, and very often what I'll do is I'll go through a textbook look at the section of the textbook that I have to cover that week and pull out some grammar that I need to cover that week or an entire sentence verbatim that I can throw up on a slide and I put it up there and that becomes one of the target sentences for the week. After a few weeks of that, I want to get them up to independent conversation. So this is the first step towards that. Now you can use this in any kind of a mix that you want. Basically, this is how this exercise is going to go. It's called word throw because all I want the students to do is just say one English word to each other. Everyone's going to prepare one word. So the first person who goes with whatever word they say will, be, will have their partner respond with their word as quickly as possible. And then they will respond as quickly as possible with their second word. 
second word, third word, fourth word, fifth word. So both people are trying to go at each other with these words as quickly as possible. Kind of, I think someone mentioned in the chat that it's kind of like a ping pong match or kind of like a tennis rally. So basically, this is what this is. Rules are that you cannot use a word in a pairing, in a single pairing, any more than once. So if you wanted to use a word, but your partner used it, uh-uh, can't use it. Okay? You have to say it as quickly as you can. You have to say it into each other's eyes, and you can't take too much time thinking. Okay. Now, of course, some of these kids might be thinking, but those are what you encourage them to do. Anybody want to demonstrate this with me? Raya, you thought the other one was kind of hard. You might want to try this. I was just thinking I kind of blanked out. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> Can you explain succinctly one no more problem. time? For I'll, I'll explain just like here. I would explain to student. Okay. Yep. Think of a word. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Now, when yeah. I say ready, go. You're going to say that to your partner or your partner is going to say their word to you. If they go first, then you get to go second. But as soon as you say your word, they're going to say their next word. And you have to have another word ready. So you're basically... So are we making a sentence together or these are just like no, no, random no. words as fast as we can go? Sort of completely thing. random words. They don't have to have uh -huh. any meaning, no connection to each other, no connection with even the last word you yourself said. Oh. They don't have to make any sense at all, but they just have to be English. Okay. okay, I'm ready. Yeah, ready. Here we go. Okay, uh, start. Or orange. Oh, kitchen. Banana. Fork. Fabricate. Knife. Accelerate. Cooking. Obituary. Mother. Demonstrate. Evening. And now I'm thinking Korean. Ah, uh, you can. <laughs> <laughs> See, your your brain is switching, and their their brains will switch. They'll Ooh, want to speak Korean this is too. Fun. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but my words were all on a theme. And your words were kind of a little bit over, all over the place. They were basically words that you could come up with. And what I'm encouraging these kids for maybe about the second round of <laughs> after the original sort of fun of it disappears is that you're going to have to do this a few more times. And you're going to get tired if you don't understand how important it is that before every English speaking situations, you actually have something you want to say. Most of you will go into English speaking situations or situations where you know you might have to speak English and you don't have anything prepared. You don't even have the next sort of uh, equivalent to, um, to a, a greeting or, hi, my name is, how are you? You don't even have that ready. How can you have a conversation if you don't have something ready to say? So do this with me, everyone. First, think of a theme. My theme was kitchen. Now, what's your theme? Is it baseball? Is it soccer? You're a soccer player. Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a Korean boy band. You love BTS. Great. Maybe uh, it's a book that you read, okay? And the book was a horror book. And maybe you can think of knife, kill, uh, blood, ghost. That's fine, whatever your theme is. But that theme, I want you to imagine it. I want you to imagine it to the finest detail. I want you to have a picture in your head. And you can imagine it from this corner all the way down to this corner, all the way down to that corner. You should be able to see colors. Now you can see colors. You can say those colors. If you can go to the next step, which is not to imagine it as a picture, but to imagine it as a video, you can see people moving. You can see people coming in and out of the frame. You can see people doing certain things, and those are verbs. Imagine it to the point where you can say what time of the year it is. Are there animals in the picture? No? Okay, only plants? Then maybe it's your garden. The more detailed you have that message ready, the more you can say. And that becomes word throw at its basic phase. The next one is what's called phrase throw. So they do two words at a time. It becomes doubly difficult. Anybody want to try this with me? No? I'm going to have to start. I can oh. try. Okay, Annika, go ahead. So the two, it doesn't matter what the two words are. It doesn't have to be like an adjective and a noun. It can just be like two words. Anything, any, any two words. But it's going to be easier if you stick with your theme. So prepare the first pair. Prepare the second pair. Prepare the next pair or whatever is best for you. But if you have an, an imagined idea, okay, then you're going to be able to keep going with it and keep that image in your head so you can pluck things out of it. Ready to go? Yes. Okay. 
Baseball, Japan. Hold a banana. Suzuki, hitter. Fork, spoon. Famous, cheer. Refrigerator, oven. Uh, audience, beer. Big table. So I'm thinking of a baseball stadium. And what was your theme, Annika? Uh, kitchen and food. Great. Okay. So it was pretty easy for us. A lot of these kids will struggle because they haven't gotten yes, you, yet used to the idea that they have to take the time when you tell them, okay, everybody choose your theme. And give them a dramatic pause in about five seconds. Got your theme? Okay. Now imagine a picture. Then you start taking them through like a guided meditation. Is it nighttime? Is it daytime? Who can you see? How many people are in there? What are the colors of their clothes? What are they doing? Are they people you know? People you don't know? Is it at the university? Is it at a shopping mall? And you take them through a guided meditation and tell them, now, choose the words you can say in English. Ignore the words you cannot say in English. Start flicking them off and then pulling them down like you're pulling books from a shelf, the words that you can say. That will be phrase throw. Now, here's where it starts to get interesting. You go from phrase throw and you tell them, okay, now I want you to start learning how to use those verbs that I know you've got a, hundreds in your head. So of those two words, one of them, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, um, I jumped. One of them, okay, come on. One of them has to be a verb. It can be the first one, it can be the second one. The second one can still be anything, a noun, an adjective, an adverb, doesn't matter. First one can be the verb, second one can be the verb. Both of them can be verbs. The only condition is that one of them has to be a verb, okay? And then you're gonna end up with students after maybe three or four tries at this, still giving them a chance to think of themes, encouraging them to think like, hey, you didn't make up two themes. Didn't you notice that we're now saying two words at a time? You're going to be running through your words very quickly. So not only prepare the imagination for preparing that one theme, prepare your second theme. And they're going to come up with stuff like this. Sister, study, play baseball. I tell them, do you remember back in April or whenever your semester starts? And I told you the only thing that I expect of you is being able to speak eventually at the end of this semester with a subject, a verb, and an object. That's all, because you can't do that right now. You're, you're, you're stuttering, you're, you're saying one words uh, to you know, say, ah, toire, toire to, toire to, where, where? And that's your version of English, even though you've been studying English for six years. Well, now look at this. If you take sister study and you put the object on it, which I know that you already have prepared, you end up with sister study English. Now, of course, you really should say, my sister studies English. But if you say, sister study English, I will understand you. If you put an I in front of play, you get, I play baseball. That is perfectly grammatical. Now, of course, if what you really meant was sister doesn't study English, that's okay. But remember, if you don't put that negation in when that's actually what you meant, you're going to end up with 180 degrees difference in meaning but you now have a completely communicative sentence. And isn't that a lot better than what you were doing before? So we go from there and we do something and I tell them here, look at that. That's a subject, a verb and an object. Isn't that what you wanted? And we do something called idea throw. So I tell them, take that sister study, put the object on it and throw at your, your partner one idea. And so it becomes sister study history. And your partner says, mother, good cook. Ah, mother, no good cook. Oh, you're too bad. Yes, but I love mother. Might start becoming a conversation, might not. If it becomes a conversation, encourage it. If it doesn't become a conversation, forgive it. These guys have a lot on their plate. If it doesn't become a conversation, it might start becoming a conversation when you start telling them two ideas. Not one word, two words. Not one idea, two ideas. And they'll struggle, but they'll say things like, I play baseball. Baseball, very good. I like BTS. BTS is very famous. Baseball uniform is dirty now. Ah, uh, I wash tomorrow. 
go on, go on, go on, go on. Now, you could start clamping down a bit and saying, well, that wasn't, wasn't really two ideas. That was just one long sentence, but you're trying. And you can start pointing that out. But you have to strike a balance between trying to get them to a slightly higher level of complexity or accuracy and encouraging them to communicate at their own level. That's something that you're going to have to choose for yourself. You do not want to ruin the environment where, see, part of what makes it so successful is that those kids in that room, that first video, these kids know I'm not listening. And because they know that I'm not listening, I'm not correcting them for things, oh, grammatically, that's incorrect, and that's not the word from the textbook, they feel free and they're able to in that incredible din. Remember this din? Nobody can hear each other's voices. Nobody can hear their mispronunciation mistakes. Nobody can hear their bad grammar or their, 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 their disfluencies. That gives them the freedom to experiment with different things. And the only thing that they're using to actually judge their ability is whether or not their friend understands them. And that kind of thing is something that you have to be very careful not to stomp on because so many of us, we go back to the idea, oh, wow, that was really bad grammar. I think I wanna do something about that. Be careful, uh, that's, that's something you wanna play with. It's much more important to keep the environment, keep the feeling of the no fail scenario as opposed to teaching grammar right then and there. Now, if you wanna teach grammar, tell them, okay, well on the uh, LMS, you have this quiz, make sure that you do that quiz. It'll help you with adjectives uh, and it'll, this will help you with the so and because clause and try to use that next week. And then maybe you can target that with some of the set phrases that you want to teach. But from idea throw, you go through multiple idea throw, two ideas each. And then you can go on to something that I call switch, which unfortunately I don't have time to actually show tonight. Maybe I will, maybe I won't, but I wanted to make sure that there was plenty of time for questions because I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some confused and puzzled looks on people's faces. But if I have time, I will show this concept that I have called the switch. If not, I have shown this many times before to a few of the other people who have seen my presentations before. And it's also on my website, which you can access here. And it's something that um, I would hope that you can watch. And if you want to, that's my email address up there, jose at goldfish365.com. Uh, please stay in touch with me. And uh, yeah. Uh, I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear from you now what it is that you find a little bit mysterious or any comments that you have about the presentation. Um, I've left plenty of time because I want to make sure I get all the questions. But in that plenty of time, I think I will be able to actually show you the remaining things that I want to show. Oh, by the way, I, I know that I'm being proud when I do this, but the people who did actually take me up on this and start using it, a couple of them are here. One of them is Mary Virgil Uchida, who's up there, and she actually gave me a very nice quote and said, it's a game changer. Now, I don't know if she wants to make a comment. Hi, Mary. Wants to make a comment on that, but not only her, but also a good friend of mine, Jenny Crittenden. Uh, she uses this in her high school, and she said that she actually finds it very difficult to get the kids to stop. When she yells, stop, they just keep going. She has a small voice, so maybe they didn't hear her, but apparently she says, no, they want to keep going. I have um, other quotation marks from um, Catherine uh, Hido uh, Akasaka. She teaches at a junior high school, so fear not. This works at junior high school, high school. Mary teaches this to little children, and mm -hmm. Adam, like me, is a university teacher and um, always seems to work. So... Um, as I said, stay in touch with me or ask me your questions now. Otherwise, I want to say thank you very much for the very warm reception that you've given me. The presentation isn't over. Don't run away. And I hope to have some time to show you the other things. But I also want to make sure that everyone has time to ask questions. Because that, that always seems kind of short of time when I do these presentations. Anyway, thank you all. So who wow. wants to go first? I have a question. Certainly. I'm curious, how long are your classes usually? Like how many times per week do you meet? How many hours do you have in the classroom doing this? A normal semester in Japan is 16 weeks uh, with a 90 minute class of so 16, 90 minute sessions. Mm -hmm. One of those sessions uh, will have to be used for the test. I often use two sessions for the test because I have fairly large classes, up to 40 students. 
and to get them into groups uh, doing 10 minute conversations per group that simply cannot be done within an 80 minute test. So I use two classes for that. So I actually give approximately 14 weeks of instruction in this, but even then they're ready to do an independent um, English only conversation at the end of the semester. So I'm curious, like, uh, so, sorry, Greg, you wanna go first? No, yeah. why don't you do your follow-up? Oh, okay, so um, I was also curious, um, have you done this in class since like COVID restrictions? What type yeah. of restrictions do you have with like distance yeah. and students moving around? Oh, I was totally, um, totally on Zoom through 2020. 2021 was a bit of a mix and I'm still a little bit on Zoom now, still works. Still works exactly the same way. Now you can't monitor as much in the breakout rooms and the breakout rooms actually will only go down to minimum time of one minute, which is longer than what I usually do when I'm actually live face to face. I discovered that my actual timing is more like about 40, 45 seconds for each one. And the breakout rooms just don't have the same kind of energy and feel because when you're in a room with 20 other students, 20 of your friends, everybody trying to yell to the point where they're yelling like this so they can be understood by their partner who's only a meter away because everybody else is yelling. So it becomes a positive feedback cycle. Everyone starts yelling. Um, you just don't have that kind of energy in a breakout room. But it did work, quite surprisingly. I was using verbal classrooms, even um, in remote classes with breakout rooms. Greg? Yeah, I, actually, uh, a comment and a question. A comment that uh, the that feedback loop is is awesome. Uh, I mean, I, I, use, I use something like what you're doing, not as quite as structured as you have. Uh, one of the things I noticed uh, about the looking up, uh, you know, face up, I really got that early, okay, that, Get them away from looking what's on their desk uh, but once they kind of got into the rhythm that they you start seeing the body language and the yeah just their gestures all picking up and the laughter yes. along with their speaking it's fabulous it's a nice uh, nice feeling what's your question that was your comment quite yeah that was my comment my question is around assessment uh um, i didn't quite catch there or whether you talked anything about uh, uh this assessment that you do okay so the assessment itself is based on being able to go into a group that they choose for themselves. So whoever you like, you guys, I'm not gonna say anything about who you're going to be in a group with, but your group will go into a room with me. So away from everybody else. And I will sit down at a table with you. This is the first semester, so I'm not going to participate. I'll simply listen. And I'm going to ask you, actually now I have to turn this off from its play mode to its um, editing mode so that then I can zoom in on it. I'm going to ask you to get into a conversation and the rubric is based on this. 100 points, 25 each for equal and natural conversation, your conversation style, your communication and your speed and your fun. 25, 25, 25 is 100 points. Speak any Japanese, I'll dock five points. Now, they are all very much aware that if they say one eto or one ano, which are Japanese pause words equivalent to um and a, uh, that I will dock them five points. Not him individually, but the entire group. So through the practice session, I tell them, look, you got to work with each other. This is a team effort. If somebody is saying um or ah uh, too much in your practices, you got to tell them. Conversation is, is the building of a team effort, even between two people in any conversation. Everybody has to speak equally. I don't want any memorized speeches. I know when you're memorizing speeches, I know when you're reciting them, it is bloody obvious in your voice. Although even saying that, one time I had this group of three girls who were actually the best English speakers in the class. I don't know where they got this idea. I warned them many times. I can tell when you're memorizing and they literally memorized a five minute conversation. And they thought they could get away with it. And at first I was going, this is awfully weird, but this is what happened. They memorized the five minute conversation to the point where they all knew exactly what they were gonna say and they memorized their gestures and their up speak and, and, and everything else, okay? So it's like a little stage play. Problem was they memorized it to run at five minutes when they were relaxed. And when they got into the test room, their anxiety drove them to speak just a little bit faster so that by the time that they ended the actual conversation, they were 40 seconds short. 
So they, they said, okay, yeah, so let's go shopping. Do you want to go shopping? Let's go shopping. And I pointed them to my watch and just sat there for the next 40 seconds. And they go look at each other going, oh, what the hell do we do now? And I just gave it to them. I said, you guys are the best students in this class. You could have done this so easily. I don't know why you did that. Anyway, so from there, equal and natural conversation. So I just generally judge if that's one third, one third, one third, and it's natural. Conversation style is, is crushed down to three words, eyes, voice, and smile. Are you looking at each other? Are you speaking with a big voice? And as nervous as you are, are you trying to look like an approachable person? Are you smiling at people? Are you looking at your other two partners? Communication, are you actually making sense? Are people actually able to understand you? When you don't understand the other person, are you able to ask questions and ask them for clarification? Uh, maybe you forgot a word. Uh, you forgot that word. Um, uh, drink, uh, Heineken, uh, Budweiser. Yeah, beer, beer. Thank you, beer. And those kind of communication tactics, we studied those. Are you speaking quickly? Are you having fun? Are you making jokes? Is everybody morose and dark and wanting to go home and hiding behind their bangs, which are too long? Okay, well, that was a crap conversation, wasn't it? And eventually, this becomes a pretty fair assessment of what they're doing. They have to speak five minutes on each topic. The topic was like that topic list that I showed from my Blackboard from 12 years ago. And from that topic list, there are 10 topics, they can choose one and that will be their topic one. Any one that they want, I will have nothing to say about it. And you guys want to practice it, go ahead. But remember, don't over practice it to the point where you've memorized. Topic two, from the same list, I will choose one and I will not tell you which one until you finish topic one. So they eventually have to practice all of them and they have to have some kind of spontaneity unless they were absolutely insane and practiced uh, for all of the topics. So. I actually pay much more attention to topic two than topic one. Topic one, they probably practice the hell out of it. And topic two, that's where they really show their true colors. This is where they actually sign their names to show that they were in the test. And um, then I have proof that they were actually there. And uh, this is group number one, and I have five or six groups per class. The actual advantages of it is that you do less take-home marking. You're going to do that rubric. You're going to add it up right there, and you're going to tell them their result. They all can know because they're all in the same group. Students know their, uh, their grade right away. Um, in the first semester, you don't say anything. In the second semester, you tell them, okay, now this time, I'm actually going to participate in the conversation. And you cannot just ignore what I say. You have to respond to what I say. So if they had memorized a conversation in the first semester, and I maybe let them get away with it, they can't do it in the second semester. It's basically the same instruction. There's nothing wrong with going to the batting cage, no matter how much of a superstar you are. The batting cage, it's worth its time when you're a junior high schooler. It's worth its time when you're a professional baseball player. Going through all of those basic sort of drills, those standard exercises is always a value. So we actually do the same, a lot of the same things in the first semester as the second. And that's my basic assessment. Now, you can trim it around and you can say, well, it's um, the independent conversation, plus you have to do this Google quiz, uh, Google Forms quiz, or this Moodle quiz on the LMS or whatever else you want to throw in as a supplement. Because I do that because I can only do one group at a time. So the other group has to do the LMS quiz while the other group is doing their independent conversations. All the kinds of ways. Group can... size is four or three people. Right. Now, if you want to force four people, you can also do it this way. I want you to choose a pair partner, anybody that you want, a pair partner, and you give me that name list, and you're going to get a stack of papers with two names on it. And you tell them, okay, I'm going to take this pair and this pair, and I'm going to put them here, and you're going to find out who your other pair is on that day. So they have no chance to practice with each other. So that also solves, but that's completely random. You can make it completely random on the day of the test. If you think these kids can handle it, but I actually want them to practice with each other, to learn how to work as a team, especially first year students. So I let them build their own groups. Thank you. Lonnie, you're quite welcome. And Stella. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for a great presentation. It's my first time. Um, and I really, really, really enjoyed this. And um, 
yeah um good to see you good to see you well that was it <laughs> that was it <laughs> okay, okay. uh before i forget um if you did get that barcode okay and the url is very simple it's just goldfish365.com vc documents you're going to get to this part of my website, which actually has all of my videos in it. The top one is that entire playlist of videos. There are about seven of them, 20 minutes a piece of me showing certain chunks of what's important in verbal classrooms. The rest of these were the keynotes that I gave, similar to this presentation. And there are bits of information that are different. I say things in, in different ways, but I basically cover uh, the same things. Sometimes I talk about them in different contexts. Sometimes I'm speaking to assistant language teachers. Sometimes I'm talking to university teachers. But the basic information probably can be gotten from one of these presentations and most importantly from the Verbal Classrooms demonstration uh, playlist. So please feel free to do that. And I will share with you one more time the uh, information to get to that. So either that QR code or that link at the bottom there. Okay. Ah, and I will put that into the chat. While I'm doing that, would anyone else like to um, ask a question? Not so much as a, of a question as um, a follow-up on a previous conversation that there is an interest in making a collaborative community where we could match students up to practice speaking with one another. Just throwing it out there and mentioning that Jose had brought that up and maybe if you want to speak to that a little bit. There's a lot of things in my mind that I would like to do with VC. Um, my immediate project this year is um, working with my, um, my book publisher, Dorothy Zemak, to finally write a book about this. Having completely decided if I'm going to write a workbook, a textbook, or basically an instructor's manual. So not really for students, but for people like you to know how to do it and to talk about the method itself. But apart from that, being able to get students to actually do it remotely online is something that's kind of like a secondary project. If that's what you want, what I would suggest, and Adam can speak to it a bit, is to get students a chance to just speak to each other, communicate with each other. Um, there's something called the IVE project the International Virtual Exchange, where students can speak to each other from different countries. And I think it would be really great to have some Korean schools participate in that as well. Now, I don't know, Adam, if there's any kind of actual live um, interaction between students where they're actually speaking to each other. There's usually an awful problem with um, time differences, right? Most of this is done in videos and stuff, but still it's a kind of uh, uh, an exchange for students to speak to each other. Mm, yeah, in the IV project this past semester, uh, we had a lot of trouble with actual a whole bunch of people trying to get online to actually talk to each other. And 90% of them didn't have microphones connected to their computers. Yeah. So voice chat was an interesting experiment. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, because we've, we're dealing with people from all around the world, we're dealing with people from many different contexts not all of which allow there to be microphones connected to computers. So yeah. something that I didn't think would be a problem in 2022 turned out to be a pretty massive one. I think we in Korea and Japan are kind of spoiled because we're at the digital cutting edge in terms of what we can expect in terms of infrastructure uh, that is prevalent uh, among our students and, and the general population. But yeah, I mean, if you're dealing with uh, people in Peru, people in Indonesia, not a given, right? But yeah, I do want to collaborate on things like that. I want to get this book out first. I will be doing more presentations like this. I'll be doing one in Hokkaido, uh, out near where Mary is uh, in uh, August, and um, hope to do more of that. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll send in a proposal for the Cotisol conference uh, this year, or maybe you can have me in as a plenary. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Were there any other questions? Oh, uh, Nicholas. Um, yes, first, thanks a lot for this, Jose. I've, I've learned a lot, been inspired. Um, also, I want to go back to what you mentioned um, earlier about um, the teacher's role while this is happening. You mentioned that it's quite draining on the teacher. 
um, and that's one of the disadvantages. Um, I was wondering um, what is it, what it is exactly that's training um, while the students are going through the activities. Is it thinking of the next activity to do and how to bridge it to the, the target language? Or are you like assessing what they're doing and coming up with what to do? All of that. Okay. You have to do all of that. And uh, for the very first time you're doing it, Adam can speak to this maybe a little bit more accurately than me because he picked up um, VC in the last year or two. And I've been doing this for 25 years. I, I don't want to brag, but it has become second nature. But I do still feel the fatigue at the end of every class because you're walking around. You're really belting out your voice. I really don't suggest this for people who still need a microphone to speak. It's not convincing. Um, you're trying to get your students to speak loudly and you're using a microphone. Kind of looks weird. Um, you are watching your students. You're trying to be as sensitive as you can and, and your brain is on fire trying to watch that student with this student. Oh, that's that pair that doesn't like each other. So just, you know, they're not going to talk to each other very much. Oh, there's that guy. He has a crush on her, kind of creepy, but it's not that bad. And you're, you're watching all this stuff happen at the same time that you're thinking about your targets on the paper that you wrote. You're thinking about the entire semester. You're thinking that maybe they're kind of tired right now. So all of those things are happening at the same time. And you might not know it until you actually try it. But I don't know, Adam, if you want to comment on like um, the difficulty of doing it for the first few times. Yeah, it's, it's exhausting, but it's good exhausting because you're exhausted because you're watching a whole bunch of active students instead of watching students who are not actually doing anything. Um, so in that respect, yeah, it's a barrel load of fun. Um, and you know, I, I was doing it this morning, so, uh, that's, and it's just the, the students as well. I mean, I, I mix in a few other elements as well. Um, for example, like today I was getting the students actually, once they'd conquered a particularly difficult construction, get them to cheer each other on and give give each other a big applause. And so that also, I was also breaking it up for them because I know it's tiring on them too. If it's tiring on me, it's going to be tiring on them. Um, I've, I've come up with a couple of cheats. One is that when I, in order to find out whether they're ready to move on to the next one or something, is when they stop looking at the board. And when they, when they keep looking the, their partner in the eyes, that, that's like, okay, they're not checking anymore. So that means that they're, they're sort of ready to go on. And I'm using those as heuristics a bit rather than trying to actively listen to every single one of them uh, speaking because that was just taking it way too much mental stress and, and making it too, too hard. So there are little tricks like that that you get used to as you go along here. Yeah. You also do want to watch these kids, but you don't want to watch them for complexity or accuracy. That really will kill the vibe. What you want to do is you, you, want, you look at them and go, look at her, look at her. You're looking at your knees. Stop looking at your knees. Look at her. Or you're telling them, you know why she's leaning in like this? It's because you're speaking in a whisper. Belt it out. Now, a lot of these kids don't really know what you mean when you mean speak from the gut. And there are ways to actually promote that. If you've ever done acting training, you show them how to do that. But I don't know if I want to waste time on that. You start doing things like, okay, everybody go, ha, ha, ha. And it just makes everybody really kind of self-conscious if you make that as a big part of your classes. Just tell them, look, she literally can't hear you. So you're going to have to fight for some way to actually bring up your voice. And I'm telling you that if you learn how to speak from your stomach, you know that that's something that's said in your culture, your language too, because it's true. Um, if there are no other questions, I can show how I incorporate what came out of a textbook into this. But are there any questions first? Because I want to answer those first. I was just curious, because you said you've never had like a student just sit there quietly, like doing nothing. What would you do if you had to like prompt a student? I've never had that problem. Mm -hmm. I literally have never had that problem. Um, if, if I ever had that problem, I would just say, switch ah. <laughs> and i would just tell them okay maybe they just don't like this guy or mm. maybe they just don't get it and i look at them and i do the demonstration again and out of the corner of my eye if they're paying more attention to me then yeah i'll maybe do the demonstration again and if students are in their pairs going yeah but i don't get it why is there no second you for the plural form let them teach each other let them speak to each other in l1 there's no problem with that 
they're actually curious about what they're supposed to be doing. Now, if they're just goofing off and they're talking about last night's baseball game, you're going to start noticing that. But maybe that means that uh, you can attack from a different thing. Maybe the next class you can you can use baseball um, as as a central theme to the sentences that you're that you're doing. Mm-hmm. Adam, um, I just thought I might weigh on this because I experienced that last week. Oh, um, so I had a student who were, who came in and. Actually, he came in a little bit late, so probably wasn't actually deliberately trying to be antagonistically, I'm not going to do this. But anyway, he came in late and he was you know, being very standoffish. And I said, join the group, join the group. And um, he was you know, nervous, about, I guess, about jumping in and didn't want to. And so even though I was saying to him to join in, he didn't. So what I did was I, I outsourced it. And I said to the students, hey, you guys at the back there, get him in there. Mm-hmm. and they did mm-hmm. and within about five minutes the problem had solved itself so because they were sort of pushing on they were they were bringing him in and they were saying okay okay this is how you do it this is how you do it um blah 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 they were off task for a few seconds and then they'd explained it to him and then he was able to somehow you know catch up to where we were and and start following on and rejoin and by the time two or three different shifts had happened in the in the snake uh it was over and done with he, he was in there and he was participating fully so um yeah you can because everybody's on the same page on how it's done you can outsource it to the kids because they know exactly what's what and i think it's softer coming from a kid than another kid in the yes, class than yes, coming yes, from yes. a teacher as well She's not here, but a good friend of mine, Alex Burke, is always looking for things that we might think as like either reticence or hesitance or, um, or um, rebelliousness. But she'll tell you, are you sure that student can see the board? Are you sure that student can hear you? Are you sure that student isn't colorblind and your choice of using blue chalk on a green blackboard is making it impossible for them to see what's going on? And you start thinking that, or I would think, now, I don't mean to brag, but with this much success that this has had, and there's a student who may be even worse than Adam's case is like weekly having problems getting himself into things, I would think there's got to be another explanation. Either it's a neurodiversity issue, it's a mental health, mental stress issue, or maybe literally they can't see the board because it's a vision issue that they don't, they don't want to discuss with their parents, or they have not even been diagnosed and they have no idea that it's there. So there are a lot of other things that could be contributing to the problem, but I'm pretty sure it's not the method. Well, and just like any other classroom, there are opportunities to scaffold. Um, I did put in the comments earlier when you were talking about make the eye contact, because I do that a lot. And I was watching a recently popular Korean drama called Extraordinary Attorney about an autistic savant who became an attorney in Korea, really cute show. And when her friend is trying to coach her on how to speak in the courtroom, she's like, if you can't look them in the eyes, look between the eyes. Yep, and yep, that yep. worked for her. So, I mean, there are all these little tweaks that we can use to incorporate different students. When we get into um, this whole system, I designed this and I'm, I'm, I was much better at it when I was able to do this with first year and second year students. And some students actually had me for all of those two years. So it's actually a four semester program. But in the third and the fourth semester, that's when we were doing um, speeches, debate, all of it without any paper, all of it without any kind of preparation or extra vocabulary that we learned. It was all from using what they knew. And um, those kind of debate moments and the heated sort of debates where they really have to look each other in the eye. I did exactly the same thing. I told them, look right here. Look right there, just just above the eyebrows, just right there. That's plenty. So I know exactly what you're saying. I did exactly the same thing. I will, if there are no, oh, no, I can't, or can I? Extra five minutes to, sh- to show those slides, Rhea, Annika? Um, what do you think, Annika? I'm okay with it, if other people are okay with it. If other people would like to leave, they can, but you're welcome to stay and learn I got, more. I got a thumbs up, and I got a, I don't know what that was, but uh, I think it was a metal. <laughs> um, okay, so if you have a textbook, just Take any sentence in there, especially stuff that you know will appear in the test, and make sure that you drill on it. So let's say that your construction that you want to make sure these kids know is the difference between so and because. Okay. Okay. Well, start with the verb that you're going to use. 
I wear? Do you wear? You wear? Does he wear? He wears? Does she wear? A couple of rounds of that. Might want to throw in a negation, throw in an object. I don't wear gloves. Okay. I wear gloves. I don't wear gloves. Go back to something that, that's a little easier or maybe put this at the beginning. I'm cold. Are you cold? You're cold. Is he cold? He's cold. Is she cold? You can see where I'm going with this. I wear gloves because I'm cold. And then you, from here, if you want to, if you think that they need a refresher on it, tell them about the difference in, in, in order between because and so, that the action, the action that you do, you wear gloves, that's the action because, and then the reason, okay? Then if you're gonna do so, I'm sorry, that, okay, the next one is why do you wear gloves? So being able to use question words is something that we practiced before. Now you wear so, you put the action after the conjunction and the reason first. So whatever you want uh, to hit the listener's ear first, then that's what you put there. Okay, so that was the target that was in the textbook at that point. And from here, this first slide to this slide, that will probably take about 20 minutes. So you have time for about two or three. And you tell them, okay, well, then that's uh, what you guys are going to be seeing in the textbook. Now, don't forget to do your homework and we'll check on that next week and we'll do some more uh, after that. And I have these slides for a class and um, the next stack that you're going to be doing is practicing their adjectives, adjectival order. You know, like I want to buy a big black round Japanese table. That kind of adjectival order is something that takes practice. It does take explanation, but more than anything else, it takes practice. So those are all things that you can take. But the basic idea is start them up with a verb, start them up with smaller sentences, then stack on the bigger sentence, and then the explanations as you go. And don't tell them things like less heavy, okay? Uh, those are things that uh, you can you can talk about um, in terms of what is common in English. We wouldn't say less heavy, we'd say lighter. Those are all things that you can use as your, your uh, general knowledge as an English instructor. Thanks for staying so long, everyone. I know that I tend to go on about this because I'm very passionate about it. I think it's a very, very good teaching system, certainly one that can supplement a lot of what we already do. If you have any questions about it, please feel free to contact me um, at the uh, slide that I showed before. I take those QR codes and you'll go to either Goldfish365, my website, or my Facebook uh, page where I post, uh, I hope to post more regular uh, updates for uh, small videos or ideas that I have that worked or didn't work in my classrooms. Um, those are all things that you can get from those QR codes. And there's my uh, email address if you want to contact me. Um, thank you so much. And Really, this is how it all began, is some of us reaching out to Jose at a different event. Please feel free to reach out and communicate and ask questions as he is asking you to do. Um, I am acting as a membership officer for the Pusan chapter. So before I turn it over to Annika, I just wanted to drop this link in the chat that we are having a face-to-face -face meeting. If you are able to be in Pusan this coming weekend, check it out, that'd be awesome. Over to you, Annika. Okay, thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank you so much, Jose, for being our speaker tonight. We really appreciate it. And have a good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, everyone.